and here's a short list. Colonel Jill was the experimental class of the Army when it tested if women could lead men. She was a 22-year-old commander along the border of North and South Korea. She was the first woman battalion commander in the 88th Regional Support Command, and she was the first brigade commander in the 84th Division, commanding hundreds of soldiers across six states. In Iraq, yes, in Iraq, she faced off with Saddam Hussein, and in Illinois, Colonel Joe was the first woman to lead Homeland Security. One of the, her proudest moments in the Army is when she stopped a Soviet, uh, or actually stopped the Soviets from kidnapping an American satellite engineer. Today, Colonel Joe is the author of the book, Courage to Command, Leadership Lessons from a Military Trailblazer. Her book has helped thousands of men and women become leaders and better leaders. Jill has, in seventh grade, had to recite a poem. And she did that by giggling hysterically all the way through. But today she has become a Toastmaster, won three district contests, now speaks professionally to many individuals across international borders, to corporations, associations, and most importantly, nonprofit organizations as well. She promises her audience that she will learn to laugh, leave you with an aha, I can do that, and she will deliver. So let's bring her up with a round wall <coughs> applause as she presents enthrall your audience. Jill, come on. Cool. All right, I know it's 9.30 in the morning, but I'm gonna try that again. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, thank you. Now for you civilians in the military, when we're saying, do you understand? Are you with me? We say, whoa. And if you are, you answer, whoa. Unless you're a Marine, then you answer, whoa. So, whoa. Whoa. Great. March back with me to 2004, the year Facebook came out. No, don't. Let's start sooner than that. When you're presenting to an audience, when you're making money presenting, there's some things you do before you march back with the audience. So let's talk pre-speech first. One of the things you do is you find out how you customize your speech to fit the needs of the meeting planner. This coming Thursday, I am speaking in Austin for $10,000. Not bad, huh? So is it worth uh, customizing my speech for the audience? Yes. <laughs> Their biggest concern, they're actually, um, they do wealth management. Their biggest competition is these uh, robot online investors. And they're very concerned about that. So when I talk about the, the challenges they face, this is gonna come up and I'm gonna talk about how they can show the advantage of hiring a live person over a robot. And right then, every, the heads will be nodding, I will own them. Whoa. Whoa. When I spoke to a union, I was asked to come in and speak to the union women to help encourage them to go into leadership. So I got from the union five women's names, I interviewed them, I got quotes from them, and unbeknownst to them, I also found their pictures. And they didn't know I was going to do this, but in my presentation, I scattered throughout it the different women. So this was one of the women who talked about one of her greatest challenges. and. I had her stand up. That audience loved me. Those five women loved me. So how can you reach out to the meeting planner and really make your presentation personal? Now that presentation I'm doing in Austin next week, it's really only one slide I've changed in one little sentence. But to them, it's gonna to be totally tailored to their needs. So how can you show that this is for them. It's about them, not about you. Whoa. Whoa. So this is pre. Next thing, of course, is know your stage, and everyone who competes today or yet last night should have walked their stage. The other thing you want to know, though, on the stage is the size of the audience. You can be 25, or my largest group so far has been 2,500. 
Why you want to know the size of your audience is because you still want to use eye contact, no, ma no matter how big the audience is. In 2,500, especially if there's lights on you, that's hard. So what I have learned to do is actually divide this, the audience into nine. So as I tell a story, I'm making sure I hit the front, I'm going to hit the middle, whether I'm stuck on stage or in the audience, I'm going to make sure I get the back at some point, the other back. I don't do it in a certain order, but it's in my head to make sure so everyone feels included. Because when you talk to one person, you're all talking, you're talking to the whole audience. But you want to make sure that you've addressed people. So even if I can't see them, at one point I'm going to look at the top of the stage and address a point to them. And now they all feel included, and even the farthest out. And that way you also are keeping them actively involved, too. So divide your audience, whatever size, into about nine. Front, middle, back, left, middle, right. Whoa. Whoa. All right, let's get on stage now. So, whoa, march back with me to 19, uh, tonight, 2004, the year that Facebook started. So let me tell you what my format is today. What I'm going to do is tell you some of my stories that I do on stage. And then I'm going to show you, I'm going to deconstruct what I've actually done. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. So March back with me to 2004, the year that Facebook came out. I worked at Argonne National Laboratory as a civilian. And I was an Army Brigade commander, as you heard in my bio. Also a mother of two teenagers, three cats, a dog, with a long-suffering husband. <laughs> I was busy. January 26, 2004, the phone rang. 5.30 in the morning. I don't know about you, but that scares me. <laughs> so I picked up the phone and went, hello? It was Uncle Sam. Morgan Fowler, we want you in Iraq. Whoa. I've been a peacekeeper. I've never been to war. They want me to go to war. I have to leave my husband, my teenagers. Any of you have teenagers? Show of hands. Any of you were teenagers? <laughs> wow, you're teenagers. Teenagers. War. Teenagers. <laughs> Uncle Sam, I can do this. <laughs> then I woke up my long suffering husband and went, Good luck. And I marched off to war. I ran all the public affairs for the commanding general there. Definitely worked with the media. And then Saddam Hussein, who had been captured in 2003. It was time for him to go before a judge in 2004. My job to get the media into the courtroom. So I went out to the courtroom. I scoped it to see how large it would be. And the courtroom was a little larger than this room. And I realized once I brought in Christina Amapour, Peter Jennings, Al Jazeera, Al Arabia, Al Arabia, not going to be any room for me. And then I went back to the green zone, and I got a telephone call, a strange one. It was the State Department. And the reason that was strange is the State Department doesn't call colonels. They call generals. And generals tell us what to do, and we say, who up? Well, this gentleman asked for me, Colonel Morgenthaler, tomorrow, according to Conti, would you please wear civilian clothes and no weapon? And I looked at the phone and said, I'm sorry, uh, this is war. Uh, yes, Colonel Morgenthaler, but according to Condi, could you please be in civilian clothes and unarmed? You know I'm in Iraq, right? Yes, Colonel Morgenthaler, but according to Condi... I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I don't know this acronym, Condi. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are a lot smarter than me. <laughs> What's a Condi? <laughs> Colonel Morgenthaler, according to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, you are downplaying the role of the U.S. military, so tomorrow could you just be in civilian clothes and unarmed? Hua! So what do you wear when you meet evil in the desert? I would not nominate myself for dress for success. <laughs> and if you notice, combat boots. No, you choose in the desert. 
So I took the media into the courtroom, and this bad dude got off of the bus. As he walked right by me, he never even saw me. He was trembling in fear, his eyes are on the ground, and as he walked by, I realized, oh, he thinks he's dying today. He thinks he'll get his sentence and be executed today. That's not what's happening. This is going to be interesting. So I'm eavesdropping at the door, and eventually he realized he's not dying today, and he started to threaten the brave Iraqi judge. I'm killing you! I'm wiping out your family! I'm coming back! And that very brave judge kicked him out. Totally different man walked out of that room that walked in. He was on top of the world. He showed and then he saw me standing there in my cities, and, and he stopped in front of me, and he checked me out. <laughs> he was stripping me to my Victoria's Secrets. <laughs> Ooh, I don't think so. He might not know I'm a colonel. I know I'm a colonel. And I just stepped in his face, and I just used every Toastmaster skill, nonverbal skill I had. And I thought, yeah, you dirty old man, you're all back in the hole. <laughs> and he stepped back and he barked out a command. And the guards burst out laughing. And as they're taking him to the bus, I'm like, wait, what did he say? Kill her. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? He used to kill people for staring at him. Mm -hmm. Not this American. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Whoa. So I am glad to announce I am alive and well. And I'm thrilled to be with you all this morning. Uh, all right, your first leadership lessons are you are the one who choose to be inferior. No one makes you inferior. So choose not. Who uh, up? And the next one is everyone stand up. I wanna have I wanna dem demonstrate with you my attitude as I looked at him. My attitude was bring it on. So I want you to turn to each other and go, bring it on. Bring it on. is HUA. Meeting planners, audiences want to be participating about every seven minutes. So HUA is one of my participation, and that's guaranteed every seven minutes, if not more. When we talked about 2004, if you notice, I started here. The past is over there. So I marched to the past. I also used a movie to set the time, I'm not a movie actually, I used um, Facebook to set the time. And Facebook is something you can use internationally. People might not know it was 2004, but you've got that visual of when it was and you announce it. One reason I make sure this story is funny is people don't know what they're going to get from a kernel. They have no clue. I am giving them permission to laugh and to laugh at me on the Condoleezza drum, how I said, oh, you guys are much smarter than me, because there is always someone who laughs, laughs on that, I don't know what a comedy is. And if it's just one person, then I go, oh, you're much smarter than me. That self-deprecating humor. And everybody's nodding with you. And so that's where your humor is. It's not, oh, look how great I am, but look at what I've learned, and laugh along with me. Um, Visuals, notice they, I kept them very simple. The only visual you should ever read is maybe a quote. And then um, I told you what the le lesson was with the one poster. And then I also had an action thing that you got to do. And I will do this with a crowd of 24, 5, or 2,500. And the whole energy of the room comes up. I've just started doing that, bring it on. I tried it spontaneously. I was speaking to several hundred women in gambling. They brought me out to Las Vegas, and they were having a hard time women stepping up to leadership, so they brought me in. And so I just said to them, you know, I've had a lot of obstacles, and I just, I reached the point of, oh, bring it on, and I go, oh, let's try that. And they all stood up and did it, and they kept doing it the rest of the conference. So now, bring it on is part of every presentation of mine, because the energy just goes on, you guys start laughing, you're looking at each other, you're having fun. Ooh -ah. Ooh -ah. All right. Now, 
march further back to 50. 1975, the year the movie Jaws came out. You heard I was in that experimental class, the first time the Army ever tried to see if women could actually lead men. Well, I had joined because my father was a Marine. And when they started that experimental class, he came to me and he said, Jilly Bear, they're opening up the Army as women as equals. I'm like, you mean I can be like you, Dad? He goes, yeah. And I'm like, cool, sign me up. So I was one of the first women, one of the first to get a four-year scholarship. Well, the summer, 1975, was between my junior and senior year at Penn State. You can figure out my age, but please don't take the time. <laughs> I learned that one from Craig Valentine, that one right there. So I'm packing my bags to go off to boot camp, the first boot camp to ever have men and women together. And I am humming, I have this. I mean, come on. I'm the daughter of a Marine. I got this. I played war in the Red Hills of Quantico. It was a real war, but I played it. I got this. And I've been to Girl Scout camp. <laughs> <laughs> What's boot camp except a little more testosterone? Man? I've got this. So my dad walks by the room and he sees me packing and he realizes. Oh my God, she's <laughs> clueless. And he comes in and goes, Jilly Bear, they don't want you. What do you mean they don't want me, Dad? They gave me my airline tickets, my orders, they want Oh no, honey, they're coming after you, they're gonna break you down. Of course they're gonna break me down, Dad. That's boot camp, break you down, build you up. Oh no, sweetie, they're gonna break you down, make you cry and get you to quit. Why? Well, to a lot of men. Women coming in as equals means we will have a sissy army. And if we have a sissy army, the Soviets will be victorious. They're coming for you. What do I do? Well, you're the daughter of a Marine. You got skills. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> okay, Dad. By the way, I do have a YouTube. I'll fake it till you make it. <laughs> And quitting's not an option. Okay, Dad. So I headed off to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 83 women on a post of 50,000 men. And they came after us. I was called a bitch. I was called a bimbo. I was called a butch. And that was just the letter B. <laughs> I also lucked out. I got a fantastic drill sergeant. So Mike Sampson, African American, he had volunteered for the army. He wasn't drafted. He volunteered to get out of poverty in the South. He was so brave that in Vietnam they promoted him to captain. Yes, and anyone who's ever served in war, that's a real hero. But in 1975, they were having a drawdown in the Army. And they said to Captain Sampson, you can get out as captain, or we're you knocking you back to Sergeant. He took the demotion. That much of an American hero. That much, he loved the military. And I think when he saw the men coming after me, I think it brought back memories of men who came after him. And he watched my back. And he had his hands full. One day, I'm in charge of my squad of men. I had a great squad of men. I'm in charge. And you never know what the obstacle is, but I'm leading them. So I'm running through the woods. This is so cool. Look at them. They're following me. This is awesome. I love it. <laughs> then I came to this. And I froze. I have a fear of heights. There are no airborne wings on my uniform. I stood there. The guys kind of ran into me. I don't know if they knew what happened. Sergeant Sampson knew what happened. And he saw me just panic. And he came up and he was real leery was he came up and he just whispered quietly so no one else could hear. Morgan Fowler, you know what? You're a warrior. Warrior! Whoa! And before I let myself think, I just ran across that bridge. All the men followed me. And the best moment, the best moment, was the officer with the clipboard who went, oh my gosh, a woman led, and men followed. 
And that's when Sergeant Sampson taught me several lessons. One was, frozen is not an option. <laughs> when you are a leader, you cannot freeze. Everyone looks at you to take them forward. That's your job, to figure out how do you get through your fear, or your lack of confidence, or your lack of experience. How do you get through that and you go forward? Whoa. Whoa. All right, so what did we just learn in that segment? You saw how I used the movie Jaws, once again, to put it in. Personal photographs. People like personal photographs of you when you're young. Or like Amy the other day did a presentation. She showed us with somebody famous that she then talked about. Boy, is, if that didn't give her legitimacy, seeing her with that famous person. So it's not conceited. It's just you're, you're showing people that they like that. They like to see where you've been, because they can look at that picture and then see where you are. So don't be afraid of using personal photographs. You saw me use dialogue, right? Jilly Bear. What dad? She became me, you became my dad. And that was the dialogue. And you can just choose people and you just keep it in your head. Um, I'm not gonna do my Soviet story, but that's three dialogues. It's me, this officer, and what I'm thinking. So I pivot for me, and then I'll do a slow southern accent for him, and then I do a straight talk for me thinking. So that's something I had to definitely practice, getting three voices at once. Um, Jilly Bear was a callback. It will be a callback in another part. Who, of course, is a callback? Oh, and Yoda, by Yoda. Who taught me? Who was my mentor? We, are, we do not just spring forward knowing all this. And if you do that, you sound really conceited and arrogant. So, it was Sergeant Sampson. It was my father. In another story, it's my mother. So think back, who taught you that? Because you want that humility. Humility and vulnerability, they want to see. Um, and then of course I use the popular culture visual. Whoa. Whoa. All right, let's go to the next story. The next obstacle we faced, fortunately I wasn't in charge, or we would have flunked. We're sitting on the bleachers, the obstacle is out of our view. But the team of all men, these teams, just the men, they kept coming back. They're like, we flunked it. We flunked it. We flunked it. And we're all sitting in the bleachers thinking, oh my gosh, what obstacle are we facing that all these teams of these big, strong men have flunked it? And then it was our time, and we go jogging up. And we come to this. And we all freeze. Let me explain the obstacle. It was a 10-foot wall of barbed wire. Rip your flesh and close barbed wire. But that's not enough of an obstacle for the Army. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They painted the ground yellow. And our goal was to get over there. So if somehow you got around under or over the barbed wire, but you touch the yellow, you're contaminated, you're dead, your team just flunked. And we're staring at this. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? But luckily, Muskorsky was in charge. Muskorsky was a big guy. He had joined the army to get out working in the coal mines. And he looked at that barbed wire, and then he looked at each one of us. He said, okay, I've got it. I'm the big guy. I'm gonna throw myself on this barbed wire. Morgenthaler, you're the little guy, and you're fast. I want you to run up my body, and you see that rope up there suspended? You grab that rope and you swing and you make it past the yellow, and you see that plank of wood over there? You throw me that plank of wood, I'll put it on the barbed wire, and the men will all run up, swing, do it. Whoa! Whoa. I said, no, no, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Are you crazy? I'm running on your body. I am not such a little god. You want to quit? Ooh, quitting's not an option. No. As he's rolling down his sleeves and he's putting his cap over his face, I'm thinking, light as a butterfly. Light as a butterfly. As soon as he hit the barbed wire, I ran up the fastest I've ever run in my life. Wear a Snapchat when I need it. And I grabbed that rope and I swung just like Jane in a Tarzan movie. I made it beyond the yellow. The adrenaline is pumping. I picked up that plank of wood. I threw it back. He caught it. He landed on the barbed wire. All the men ran up, swung. 
We did it! That's when I learned how to chest bump. We did it! And then the officer with the clipboard came out and went, Cadets, you just broke the 25-year record on that obstacle. The team with a girl. Whoa, we did it! <laughs> and that's when I learned there's a reason for the big guy. There's a reason for the little guy. And you, as a leader, must find the gifts and skills and passions of each and every person on your team. And you bring them together. Because when you bring everyone's strengths together, there is no weakest link. Whoa! Whoa! All right, what did we just learn there? I went very physical in describing the obstacle with the barbed wire. I went very physical with the chest bumping, so don't be afraid to get up here and act. Advice, I took acting at a community college when I was told to. I took storytelling workshops. I took improv. All of those helping me on stage, big and bright. Dialogue, once again, on characters, a call back to never quit. Lessons learned, you notice I found a popular cultural item once there on the lesson learned. I am going to, I'm going to skip, because the time is less. Let's go to this next one. This is so good. Edgy humor, I'm going to title this next piece. Edgy is good. First clear it though with your mating planner. Is edgy okay? And most of them will go, yeah. In fact, I've asked permission, can I call myself Colonel, ba Colonel Badass? Oh, please do. <laughs> so, I have heard the term authentic leader. I didn't quite get it because I always felt I was a authentic, what you see is what you get. And then I realized, no, you know what, back at boot camp, I wasn't authentic. I was trying so hard to be one of the guys. I thought if I was just one of the guys, I'd make it through boot camp. So when they told dirty jokes, I told dirty jokes. When they belched, I belched the alphabet. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how hard is it to be one of the guys? They're, well, six foot five, I'm five foot six. They're wrestlers. I'm a swimmer. They bench press 150 pounds. I was 150 pounds, <laughs> but seriously, how hard is it to be one of guys? So I worked so hard on that, and then one day I learned I wasn't one of the guys. We had a ropes across the river that we had to go across with all our gear, arm over arm. And the drill sergeant said to us, this is Mr. River. Mr. River stays clean. Nothing goes into Mr. River. Empty your pockets. So the men are pulling out their black wallets, their black key fobs, their black phones. And my pocket are these. <laughs> and I don't know how you were raised, but I was raised in the 70s by a very genteel mother. You never showed these. You never talked about this. I, we didn't have terms like Shark Week. Or, uh, red Tide, <laughs> Crimson Tide. <laughs> so there was just no way I could physically take them out of my pockets and put them on the pile. So I thought, well, okay, my pockets are buttoned. I'm okay. So I started to go across the road, and my body betrayed me. All of a sudden, my fingers are going boing, boing, boing. And I plunged into the river. And as I surfaced, so did the tail. <laughs> and as women know, tampons float. <laughs> and they floated merrily down <laughs> And the drill sergeant lost it. I'm living his worst nightmare. Get those out of Mr. River! <laughs> Did I mention I was a swimmer? Yeah. Oh, thankfully! So I'm swimming after them. <laughs> finally grab one, I finally grab the other. Oh, I come back on shore. They're driven. And he is just screaming. And I'm thinking, I guess I'm not one of the guys. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not one of the guys. Who up? Be the best version of you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> so on that one, edgy humor. Let the laughter roll. Don't step on the laughter. Because sometimes it'll keep going, it'll keep going. And you know what, I'm going to guess, out of all my stories, 
I've only started telling this one recently. Out of all my stories, this is probably the one they're going to remember the most. <laughs> no one has probably ever seen a tampon on screen. <laughs> um, use your senses. Use the fun motion. That's part of taking acting so you don't feel self-conscious. You know, I luckily was a little girl in Hawaii, so I could kind of do that hula thing. <laughs> so we've got just a few more minutes. Let me do one final story. Recently, this beautiful young reserve officer won. This universe. When she won, she brought back a memory for me from boot camp. It's a memory that's actually not in my book. At the end of the summer, at the end of boot camp, they said, you know what, we got women. Let's have a beauty contest. And my captain said, Morning caller, we're having a beauty contest for Miss Foxhole 1975. <laughs> and I said, Sir, that sounds dirty. Yeah, well, you're in it. No, sir, I don't want to be in it. I, I, I joined the Army to be a soldier. Well, Morgenthal, you're in it. No, sir. Morgenthal, you're in it. And then Maria, beautiful Latina from Puerto Rico, she goes, sir, I'll be in it. No, Morgenthal is in it. And then Muskorsky, remember big Muskorsky? He goes, sir, I'll be in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Muskorsky, you're in it with Morgenthal. So they march me to this beauty contest. 5,000 men outside this tent. I'm sitting back and I'm hearing these men calling out women's body parts. I guess we, we ended up being bimbos. And I'm sitting there and I'm upset. This is not why I joined the army. Why is my captain doing this to me? I felt so betrayed. And soon it was down just to me and Luskorsky. And he said, Morgan Fowler, get out there. So I walked out on stage, 5,000 men screaming at me, and once they quieted down a little, I gave them the finger. <laughs> and then I did an about face, and I ran off the stage, through the tent, back to the barracks, and I sat outside the barracks, and I cried. And I was so betrayed. And then I heard a thunder of feet, and it was my guys. And they came up and they're laughing and they're hugging me and they're going, we told Captain not to let you on stage. We told him he didn't know what you were going to do on stage. <laughs> and then we heard the thunder of more feet. It was Muskorsky and he said, Morgan Thaler, I don't know what you did. I've got this until 1975. <laughs> and I am proud to admit, uh, to say, there never was in this foxhole 1976. <laughs> The lesson I learned from that was I never was left. I had a great team. Whoa. 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 All right, we gotta wrap this up. Showing your vulnerability is good. It's okay. You have to stay in control. So I do find myself sometimes almost tearing up on that or other stories, but you stay in control. But go ahead, because if the audience cries, they're with you. But when you take them down, you gotta bring them back up. You don't leave them down. They're not paying you for down. They're paying you for up, uplifting and hope. And that's what they hire speakers for, to provide hope and how. So when you put together your presentations, think of that. Hope and how, and it's like Val uh, Craig Valentine said, tell a story, make a point. Now, a lot of people do make a point, tell a story, make a point. I just tell the story, then I make it. We use lots of them, lots of visuals. Once again, simple visuals and you will help involve everyone. And you will, at a certain point, you will know, or you should take the time to know and go, oh, I own this audience, they're all mine. <laughs> I had you guys on the tampons, that's for sure. <laughs> so in conclusion, here are some of the points we learned. Use your stage, get to know your audience ahead of time if you can. Even some of that is just showing up early and introducing yourself, and you're not going to believe it, but I'm initially a shy person. So I have to force myself to introduce. And then finally, I've got a book to give out. So I have underneath a seat a little ticket that says, Winner! And this is one final trick I'm showing you guys. Here you go, Winner. Oh, there's the winner! Book. <laughs> and you want the book too. So that's another trick. 
put it towards the back where people have to, if you don't have them come up, pass it. So final two And how are we on time? Enough time for a few ticket, a few questions? Yes, we do. Cool. Uh, I, what you see is what you get, so please ask me. Yes. Can you explain like your practice preparation for the meeting? Like leading up to the Thursday meeting, what is your routine? Okay. Um, what I do when I first create my speech, I sit down and go, what are my points? And then I figure out what are my stories and then what are the illustrations. Now it's come to the point where it's more, okay, these are the points. I already have the story, so this is where I put all the slides together. And then what I do, I actually put my presentation on Dropbox and then upload it on my phone. So before I came here the last few days, I've been, just been skimming through these slides, reminding myself what I'm going to speak on because they are different and I need to remember where they're different as I'm doing the presentation. Because this one has my, it shows me my next slide, but you don't necessarily have that all the time. So I just swipe through it. Now when I first learn a new story, I physically do it and then I practice it in front of Windy City Toastmasters, the professional speakers. I never tell a story without them helping me tweak it. I want to make sure I don't use military jargon, no one will understand. I want to make sure the last word I think it is. And then, once I'm on stage, I also think about this. I have one story where I say three women lesbians in the Army. I tell that when I talk about leadership stuff, the stupid, they were, these were my best soldiers, I was supposed to kick them out. How stupid is that? Um, one day I speak in front of a big corporate group and I saw two women and I could tell they were gay and I thought, you know what, that story's going back in this time. And they both came up and said, thank you for sharing that, thank you for being so brave to do that back in the 70s. So I'm flexible enough to also go. So I really like that segment. I know, I, hopefully this isn't too long of an answer. The other thing is, like today, I thought I had a full 45 minutes. I had less, so I actually removed some slides. So I'm, it's easy for me. And if you ever fall in an award ceremony, oh my gosh, they go on forever. You think you have 45 minutes, now you're down to 20. So how, what do you segment out? So I'm always over-prepared, too, if for some reason, I never, I never run out of slides. As you can see, I kind of just went, well, let me go through to the next story. So I'm honoring the time. Yes, sir? I noticed in your slides, they're outlined in purple, and you're wearing purple. Is oh, you are brilliant! Clothing? Is that part of the yeah. thick? I, I'm one of the speakers. I actually brand myself with purple. Now, most speakers do not brand themselves by a color. And I, what I'll do, I'll have a slide, why purple? And on my homepage, why purple? And that's because in the military, purple is everyone working together, Army, Navy, Air Force. So that's why Colonel Jill, all of this, it also makes shopping really easy. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, so that's why, yeah, it's a subtle brand. Okay. All right, I have read. I have one minute. I'll take one last question, James. So how did you transition, <clears throat> move away from, uh, how did you go from being a Toastmaster, speaking to Toastmaster, to being a baby? When I ran Homeland Security, all of a sudden, the governor realized I was a good speaker, so he kept sending me out to speak. And the people started saying, would well, you speak on other things? Uh, sure, uh, leadership. Um, and what I found was leadership sells. I tried personal safety, didn't sell. Leadership <laughs> sold. <laughs> and then I started learning how to negotiate. I have taken a National Speakers Academy twice. That is the business of speaking. They taught me a lot. One thing when you negotiate a fee, you never throw out a number. You've lost. You're either too high or too low. I had one guy who threw out 5000 They said, sorry, we wanted a $30,000 speaker. Mm -hmm. So my first big speech was with the union. And I, they said, what's your fee? I said, what's your budget? They said, we can only afford 7500 And I said, well, because you're in Chicago, I'll do it for that. And of course, at home, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I have to do it for that. So it's, you have to learn how to negotiate. And often they will tell you what their budget is. And now I've reached the point where I'm, my minimum usually now is 3000 And the most so far I've made is 12000 But I am trying to sell my story of saving the engineer to Hollywood so I can be the $60,000 speaker. <laughs> Push it out to the universe. Thank you very much. Um, I have to turn it back to German, who will wrap it up with <laughs> Thank you.
did you guys learn anything? Yes. Did you guys learn anything? Yes. At this time, I'd like to remind you to complete your evaluations. You can leave them at your, uh, at your desk, at your chair, at this table, or the table behind. The next session will start here in 15 minutes promptly, so if you're staying for it, cool. Now, I would like to thank very much our Colonel Jill for a wonderful topic, and on behalf of Toastmasters, thank you so much for being here today. And once again, thank you for your time, and another big round of applause to the Colonel.